My turn? Yes, okay. <laughs> I have to admit something to you. And usually when I teach, I'm really not nervous at all. In this period, I teach three lectures a week, so it's kind of a thing that I do all the time, and it's, that's very much OK. Um, and um, for instance, last summer, I danced the whole show, and I wasn't nervous. But now I'm really, really very nervous. Um, and there's two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that I'm teaching, I consider this teaching, to a different audience. So it's my colleagues, my family, my friends that are sitting in the front rows. Some of them are sitting a little bit more in the back. Um, and that makes me very nervous because I, I never talk to you, right? The fact that there's also students makes me calm again. So that's very nice. Um, the second reason is because um, I understood that in the last lectures you also talk about yourself. I mean, not as a goal. It's not that you talk about yourself like see who I am and how fancy I am, but it's, it's about what is important to you as a person. And in order to um, try to show that to you, I also must tell you something about myself. And I really, really dislike talking about myself. Um, but I will have to do that, um, because otherwise I can imagine that you think, okay, but why is this woman standing over there and teaching this lecture? So um, this is one of the tasks that I've set myself that I will do today, not for a very long time. I try to keep it as short as possible, but I will have to tell you something about myself. Um, all right. Um, when I told people that I was going to teach a last lecture, there were two <laughs> sorts of reactions. So the first was the reactions by my colleagues, and they said, oh, Adam, great, and that's really an honor, and wow, the students must really value you, and that made me only more nervous. Um, and then I thought, okay, but wait, if this is great, it's such an honor, then maybe I should invite my uh, friends and my family as well, right? Because that's then something that you uh, can show to uh, uh, the people important to you. But then when I told you, my friends and family, that I was teaching a last lecture, you all said, huh? <laughs> Uh, are you fired? <laughs> What's going on? And somebody uh, even asked, okay, but sorry, is this your strange way of telling me that you're dying? That this is your last lecture? So it was really very different responses. And um, I agree that uh, I consider this an honor. I, I don't think um, I can see it in any different way. Um, if you are asked to tell something about what makes you take what is important to you, then um, that, that's a big honor. Um, and no, I'm not fired, at least not that I know of. I'm looking at my boss right now. But maybe I'll, I'll be fired after this lecture, we don't know, but as of now, I'm not fired. And again, as far as I know, I'm not dying. Just to make sure that you can sit comfortably and that you don't um, feel scared or worried. All right, the idea about the last lecture, um, and uh, before I worked here at this university, I also didn't know about this idea. It's, I think, a relatively an uh, old thing that has been going on for many years, and the idea is <laughs> that it's an ongoing series of lectures, which means that at university, and here we do every semester, or at least once a year, right, they, uh, one of the teachers is asked to pretend that they are uh, giving their last lecture, so it's something that, that goes on and on uh, every year, uh, where top academics, top academics are asked to think deeply about what really matters to them, right? So it's not, uh, uh, I didn't think about um, which subject is most uh, interesting to, to teach or which subject is most fashionable, but I really thought about what is it that is important to me and that I would still want to teach. And then you are supposed to give this hypothetical final talk where the idea is that I think about which, uh, what wisdom can I give you, can I show to you um, that um, um, I would tell you if it was my last chapter, right? That's the idea of the last chapter. So I picture uh, all of these uh, great scientists behind their microscope and then they do a big, uh, they, they find out big things and they get Nobel Prizes and that's, I thought, the type of person that we actually gave the last lecture. Um, and uh, one of you, I won't call out any names, actually suggested that I would buy a suit uh, which would make me look much older in order to fit more with these uh, women. I decided to look like this. I'm sorry if that is a disappointment. Now you know that that was also an option. But um, yeah, well, I don't really fit the criterion, I think, of uh, what you might think of when you talk about the last lecture. This is really. 
So the question could be, why me, right? I'm not a top academic. I mean, I don't even do research anymore, so um, that's one of the criteria I'm being a top academic. I'm young, or at least young-ish, right? So I'm not old and then matured and wise and maybe uh, close to dying. I'm not dying as far as I know. Uh, so why me? And I asked myself this question. So young guy, where are you? Young? There? There. He came to me uh, in the hallway and he said, hey, Emma, would you like to do a last lecture? And I was a little bit like, uh, no. And then he said, well, you know, you would be a good candidate. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, maybe I might be a good candidate. And there's um, a specific reason. That's also the reason why I need to tell you my life story. And the reason is that I felt different for a long time. Different in the sense that I felt that I would be dying very soon for a long time. Um, and I'll tell you my life story in a couple of slides because that's how you understand why I felt that I would be dying for a long time. And then we'll move on to the academic and the more um, fun part. <coughs> so uh, this is my metaphor for this last lecture. Um, so it's a board game, right? Um, and I like this metaphor. It's a metaphor for life in general. I like this metaphor because it has one little box for each year and I'm, I like structure and I like things to be neat and exact. So um, this is the metaphor that we will use. And this uh, board game ends at 62, but when we talk about life, it might continue later or it might stop earlier, right? Um, and just as in a board game, at the end, it's game over. Right? So I think this is a nice uh, analogy to talk about uh, life. This is me when I was about three years old uh, on the red couch that, that I still have, by the way. Um, and I was, I think, listening to a fairy tale over the headphones. And, and I would say I look very um, happy, right? I look like a happy radio kind of kid. And then when I was four, um, and this is a lightning spark, a lightning spark. Because my mother, who was uh, 33 at the time, she died of uh, cancer. She had me and my brother, who was only six, no, not six, 11 months old. Um, and this has had a big impact on my family's life. Sorry, I see my aunt crying, so I'm trying to look. I'm not crying. Sorry? I'm not crying. Okay. <laughs> so that makes me emotional a little bit as well. That's okay. Um, so this is, this is really an event that has had a big impact. On my life. And I would say it has cast a shadow over the next um, couple of years. And I really often get the question what, it, what does it feel like losing your mother? Um, and it's a really hard question for me to answer because I don't live in a parallel universe where, where I didn't lose my mother, right? So that's the reality of things. And I just know how I feel and I don't know how I would have felt um, otherwise. So it's a difficult thing for me to say. But I try to think of again a metaphor. And I think the metaphor for me is that my life, um, from the outside, when you look at it, it looks perfect. It looks like, you know, a house with a roof and, and a terrace and some, you know, all these nice things. But what's actually going on with it is that underneath this house, there's a very icy river. Um, which means that no matter how um, happy I feel, no matter how good I feel, I always also feel sad. And this is... Um, really true. I always also feel sad. And um, I, I notice it especially when things, um, uh, when I'm very happy, um, I, don't, I, I don't remember what it was, but yesterday I was very happy at a specific moment. And then I felt also because I was preparing this talk that the more happy I get, the more sad I get at the same time. So that's the strange thing going on. And if you live on a house that is built over an icy river, it's just really hard to get warm. And it's really hard to feel comfortable. And it's really hard to not have damn clothes all the time. So it's really something that sticks with you uh, all the time. Yeah, when I was 16, my father uh, became ill. And when I was 21, my father died. So I had this one parent left, um, who was my everything. And he was gone all of a sudden. And that, um, sorry, that was, yeah. Too much. The, the, the shadow over my life became a very big shadow. Um, and I won't say that it was hard to continue living, because that's what people ask them, isn't it very hard to continue, continue living? It's not hard to continue living, it's the only thing that you can do. There's no, there's no other choice, so you just do that. But the water actually grows, and here the water is 
below the house, but sometimes it also felt like it was there. And sometimes it still feels like it's there. Um, so even though, again, from the outside, the picture looks perfect, it's not so perfect from the inside. And it's not something that is with me all the time, luckily, because you know I can also be very cheerful and very energetic and very happy, but it is something that I always uh, feel. <coughs> Um, losing both of my parents really made me prioritize. So it really made me um, think about what matters to me and what I still want to do with my life. So from an early age onwards, and I remember really being a small kid and thinking about this already, also feeling very different from other kids who were just playing, um, I would think about what do I still want to do? Maybe there's not so much time left, so what do I still want to do with my life? What do I want to achieve? Um, and which things do actually make me happy. And I did this as a young person uh, already. Uh, and then in the years after my uh, father died, um, I really uh, lived on full speed. I did so many things, uh, it's, it's almost imaginable. So I had a full-time job. Next to that full-time job, I had two volunteer jobs. I started my own company. I went on four study trips to different countries with uh, students, and one of my uh, co-study trip people is over there, so she knows about it. I got a PhD degree. Uh, I made my own music theater show that we performed in different cities. I danced in six other shows. I got married to my husband, who was sitting over there. I made a documentary about my parents, so a, a movie of 45 minutes. I went volunteering abroad twice. And I did all that before I was 30, in about five or six years. Um, and the reason why I lived at full speed is because all, I always thought that life would end at 33. I thought that my life would be finished when I was 33. Not because Jesus supposedly died at 33, <laughs> or because Jeff Buckley, the singer of the best version of Hallelujah, died at 33, but because my mother, she died at 33. And I felt that I was like my mother. I would be like my mother. And so that really made it made a big difference, has a big impact on my um, life. So there was kind of this, this um, wall between the age of 33 and the rest of my life. There was, it was just not possible for me to look over this wall. It felt like I couldn't look into the future. And then a very strange thing happened. I turned 34. <laughs> I turned 34. <laughs> and I celebrated this um, with my friends and family. Um, we had a big party. Uh, we talked about uh, my parents, what they were like. We talked about um, what I was like, whether I actually looked like them, and so on. And it was really a very big thing um, for me to turn 34. Around that time, I also found out that I wasn't likely to die of ovarian cancer, which is what my mother died of, because I didn't have her bad genes. And all of a sudden, this wall came crumbling down. And I really felt like I had to step out of this coffin that I was already lying in. You know, I was, I was kind of ready with life and living, and I had to think about Oh my God, this future. Oh my God, this future. What do I do with all this time? Now I'm uh, 38. Um, so it's been a couple of years uh, between turning 34 and 38. Um, and I've, got, uh, I've gotten a little bit used to the idea that there's future um, ahead of me. But you, uh, I think you understand by now why I took um, the invitation to come over here and talk about what I want to teach, right? Because I've really been thinking about this um, already. So um, today I will talk about what did life actually teach me. I will talk about what I actually teach already because I figured um, the things that I teach already, the things that I teach my students in my courses is probably the things that are important to me. So I looked into my courses um, and uh, because they said they are very personal to me, I put everything that I, I think is important I put in my courses and to see which lessons, of all of these lessons, because I teach many courses, I would like to teach for them this supposedly uh, last time. 
So students, um, I know some of you were in my courses or are still in my courses. If you recognize some things, then you know. Um, and there's one common denominator of, um, out of the things that I uh, teach that I find very important, uh, which is called character building. Uh, and this is really about, um, and this is now I'm talking to my students, sorry, I'll call you my students today. And um, you are here to learn more than the content of your courses. You are not here to only learn about, uh, you know, uh, social innovation or econometrics or whatever it is. You are here to learn from life. And obviously, you know, if you weren't at university, you would also learn from life. But I think if you being at university gives you a very good um, way and very lots of tools in order to learn uh, what is uh, important in life. Um, and when we talk about character building, if you look uh, uh, look into um, the literature, this is about the ability to be, to engage in self criticism. So the ability to look at yourself and see what might be going wrong or what might be better. Um, it's about so societal critique, so looking at society and um, trying to figure out what might be different in society and do something about it, which leads to responsible citizenship. So um, in trying to help you build your own characters, we also hope that you will um, become more involved and more responsible citizens, because I think that's really what our country, or maybe, maybe not even maybe, what the world um, really needs right now. So in order to do that, you must develop a couple of um, things. The first one is self-reflection. Um, so you need to be able to look into the mirror and be um, honest about what you see, for the good and for the bad, right? And be maybe even critical about what you see. So think about who you are, what makes you you, and what you might still want to change. And I think, um, especially being at university, it, it, there's all kinds of ways in which that, or things that you could use in order to change. But it's not only about looking at what could become better, it's also about um, looking at what you could be. Um, it's, it's about building confidence, it's about um, seeing the, the, the potential that you have. And if you can see that potential, that also gives you this responsibility in order to act on what you think is important. Right? And grit is another one. So whatever happens, you do your very, very best to get to what you want to achieve. And perseverance is another one. So this snail would never get anywhere if it didn't keep on trying no matter what. Um, and it turns out that this grit and perseverance are um, um, and success factors um, in your later life, right? So if you have a lot of grit and perseverance, uh, that leads to success, but also to success in later life. Um, and I think that's why this is uh, very important. And this character building, if this is done well within a person, right, it leads to professionals who are very responsible, so who will take up the responsibility to act if it's necessary. Uh, people who are solidary, so who will try to look at other people, who will try to make connections and make sure that everybody is okay. Um, people who are developed personally, so that they get the best out of themselves. People who are team spirited, right? Uh, so people who are easy to work with, who know uh, how to deal with other people, and people who are engaged in terms of citizenship. Um, so these are all very nice qualities when we talk about uh, character roles, very nice things that our society needs, I think, on this topic. I will um, today teach you four lessons that I think are most important to me. And again, it is my last lecture, so I was the one who could choose what I think is most important. Um, they might be different than what you expect, but I do think that they are related to character building, and I will tell you um, how they are related to character building. Um, and I will also explain the theory behind the advice for the indispensable academic touch, right? We're here at a university, so I also need to tell you something about the background of these things. So that's what I will do during the rest of this lecture. Um, and feel free to ask any questions. Uh, for those of you who have, who have been in my courses, you know that I, um, maybe you don't know, but then I'm telling you now, I like it best when students ask questions and I'm, I have to think very hard about what it is and why and, and so on, because that makes me learn as well. So feel free to ask questions if you have any. 
The first thing, the first lesson that I want to teach you or that I want to show you is be light. Do things that make other people happy. And sometimes even do things that make yourself happy. Um, and there's different ways in which you could delight um, other people. Um, and for every person, I think if you start doing this, you find your own distinct way of uh, delighting. But I'll show you a couple of examples just so that you can know, uh, know which kinds of things to think about. So it's relatively easy to delight by giving somebody else a present. And it doesn't have to be a big present. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's not about how much it's worth, but it's about the fact that you give some, something to somebody else, that you give attention to somebody else. Um, so this is an easy way. Another easy way, and I practice this uh, usually when um, I feel down, um, so then I, I go outside, I live in the, in the middle of the city center of the city of Dumbos, uh, and when I feel down, I go out, I walk around, and I just smile to people. And what always happens is that people first look at you like, uh, okay, what is this woman doing? And then they cannot help themselves with a smile back. And if I do this for 15 minutes and I've got you know, 27 smiles in return, then I feel better again. And I can assure you that these people also, at least for a brief moment, felt um, better. So again, it's a very easy way. It works best with elderly people. So if you want to try this out, <laughs> not with elderly people. Because they don't do the <laughs> part, they just smile back at you straight away. And another idea is to give people compliments. Um, so look at a person and see what you like about them and tell them. It's really as easy as that. There's, there's not more to it than that. Um, one of the things when we talk about compliments is you have to say stuff that you really believe. So if I uh, hate uh, Gaston's uh, shoes, um, I don't, but then and, and I tell you, oh Gaston, these shoes are very nice, then you will feel that I don't mean this compliment, right? So only say nice things to people when you really mean them. But I think that can make a big difference on a person's um, take. Um, you can also delight yourself. And I'll show you an example of how I delight myself. Um, but it's... Um, I feel a little bit vulnerable sharing this example with you. So um, I'll first tell you about the example and then I will set some rules. And um, so the example is uh, something that I asked uh, for my birthday. And um, so uh, my uh, in-laws, they always ask me for a list, what do you want? And then I put this thing on my list. And then I had to send them an email afterwards, I really want this, don't think that this is a joke. And they bought it and then they gave it to me during a nice dinner. And I unpacked and everybody at the table was looking at me like, oh my god, she's mad. Why would you want this, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but I knew that if this would be in my house, it would make me happy, it would make me grin all the time. Um, I have it uh, in my house, and every time I come, come down from the uh, bedroom, and I walk into my living room, I really feel like doing that. Um, so I'll show you what that is, but there's a couple of rules. So the picture that you are about to see is confidential. <laughs> Anybody who shares this outside of this room, I cannot put sanctions on that, but I will be very disappointed. This is a joke. This is my shark sleeping bag. <laughs> and it has real fins. Um, so every time I sit uh, down uh, to watch uh, Netflix, my TV is on that side. Um, I put on my shark sleeping bag, goes up to here, and I feel like, <laughs> look at this shark. And then uh, what, when I'm not wearing it, it hangs over the, the, the back of the couch. So when I come downstairs, I see this shark lying on my couch. Maybe you think it's stupid, but it really delights me. And it's not about what you think of this, right? It's about doing things for yourself that make you happy, whatever that is, right? All right. <laughs> so delighting is about doing something that makes another person or yourself also find smile. And the idea behind it is called a mimicry. So and the idea behind mimicry is that we automatically mimic, take over things from other people. And we do that very automatically. We don't have to think about that. So, and this mimicry, this taking over things from other people, facilitates social interaction. So it makes it easier to, to talk to each other and to, for instance, work with each other. And it facilitates uh, interpersonal bonding. So you get a better relationship when you mimic somebody else. And we do this unconsciously, right? It's not something that we have to think about. 
Does this make you feel like yawning? That's exactly what mimicry is about. So our brain works in that way that when we see somebody doing something, we, we want to do it as well. And even for babies who are very small, uh, it is actually shown that they imitate each other's cries. So if there's a baby crying in a room with other babies, they all start crying because they imitate each other. And the funny thing is, they only do that when it's a real cry. So when one of the babies is crying, not because they feel sad, but just because they you know, want to, I don't know, manipulate or want to do whatever, then the other babies don't cry. It's only when they are really sad. Um, speakers also adopt each other's accents. So when you leave, you will speak English a little bit more with a Dutch accent like mine, because you've heard me speak. You will mimic my accent. The good news is that this also wears off, right? So uh, you don't have to speak uh, English with, with a Dutch accent all the time if you didn't, um, but you will for a brief uh, period of time. So we take all the feelings and gestures and tics and accents and all these kinds of things from other people um, as if they were our own, right? It feels like this is something that we do because we feel like doing it. Um, and we even do this with strangers, and that's also why the smiling example works. Even with strangers, if you just smile at a person, they have to smile at you. There's, there's, there's no way of not doing it. And when we do, and I think that's the most interesting part, we like each other better. So if I smile at a stranger, the stranger likes me better than if I wouldn't smile. Um, but also, if I were sitting at a dinner table with any of you, and I would mimic your posture, you would start liking me better. So that's maybe something that comes in handy in the dating scene or whatever you do, right? You know how to uh, do this. Uh. And um, this is why this is happening. Uh, this is called the perception behavior uh, link, which actually says that the regions of the brain that become active when we see something are the same regions of the brain that become active when we actually do that same thing. So to our brain, there is no difference between seeing and doing. Um, so whether I see something, the same thing in the brain is actually firing as when I do something. So it doesn't matter whether you see, see somebody doing it or whether um, you uh, do it yourself. Um, but I must warn you because the lighting is very difficult. It sounds easy, but it is really, in, in order to do it uh, and really do it wholeheartedly, it's very difficult. Because it kind of makes you vulnerable, right? I'm admitting that I have a shark sleeping bag. Kind of made me feel uh, vulnerable because it's usually things that we're not used to doing so much, right? Giving a compliment. If I say to somebody, well, it's a very nice skirt, and they say, well, it was on sale, then boom, you know, that, that gives me a bad feeling. So um, it makes you vulnerable. You have to set aside your pride and prejudice, right? So you have to think about, okay, what can I do for this other person? And it might be something that you're not comfortable with doing, or it might be something that you find strange, maybe even. So you have to set some stuff aside. Um, and another reason why it's difficult is because people don't recognize the effect they might have on others with these little, these little things, right? And you know, everybody thinks, how, how big of a difference does it make when I give somebody a compliment? It does make a big difference. Um, but you just have to recognize that. So do something that makes another person smile, because then you smile as well, and you get two smiles for the cost of one. So even if you're into economics and you don't care about my psychological talk, I mean, this has to sell it to you, right? You get two smiles for the cost of one, that's a bargain, I would say. All right, this is how my students delight me sometimes. My students don't always delight me, but sometimes. Um, so uh, once I forgot my attendance list, which is a list with names, and then students have to put a cross behind their name to indicate that they were at a lecture. And then I told my student, could you please just, you know, give, uh, rip a piece of paper out of your notebook and then write names on it. And, um, they, um, the first student who did that actually added uh, her favorite quote. And then all of the students added their favorite quotes. And all of a sudden I got this brilliant list with quotes from students that I knew and I could really see, oh yeah, I, I understand why this is your favorite quote. And it really made me very happy. It's still on my... Um, um, cabinet in my office. Um, another example is uh, a card that I got from one of my former students telling me uh, what they liked about my course. Um, and it's just a small thing that you can do, but that, that's re that really makes me as a teacher motivated to be the best teacher that I can ever be, because sometimes somebody tells you what it is. And last, um, yesterday actually, I taught my last lecture in the consumerism 
uh, lecture. And then two students came to tell me, well, Adam, thank you very much. We enjoyed it. And it oh, really made my whole day, right? So it's just as easy as that. And even last week, um, we were talking about Gevulde Cook in the strategy marketing lecture. And one of my students is from Bulgaria. And he said, well, I, I never had a Gevulde Cook. So first, we all said, you never had Gevulde Cook. Oh, you really need to eat a Gevulde Cook. And then uh, during the break, one of his co-students bought him a Gevulde Cook. That is what the lighting is about. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it is about trying to see what the other person needs. So it's our responsibility, I think it's our responsibility, so now I'm going to be the stern teacher that says the responsibility to delight and to look, look for delighters, because it makes the world lighter and happier and friendly. <coughs> and it's really about small things. It doesn't cost you too much, but it really makes a big difference in the world. So that's my lesson one. And how does this relate to character building? Well, if you start delighting, you have to be open to other people. You have to look to other people and try to see what they um, need. And that, I think, is if you can really learn how to do that, that's very valuable during the rest of your life, right? Your future working life or just anything in your life. I think it's very uh, helpful if you can do that. Lesson two. Uh, experience instead of buy, and this is not new to the consumerism students, I'm sorry, you can doze off a little if you want to, but it's actually <coughs> different uh, research. Um, so um, in these two pictures, this is things that I do, which either cost me money or cost me a lot of time, but it doesn't get me any money, um, but it's experiences that I do. So the, uh, for you on the right picture is where I uh, uh, work with children who lost uh, one or sometimes more of their parents or who have cancel themselves, and I coach them through this whole uh, period in time. Uh, I try to help them as much as possible. I don't get anything in return in terms of money, but I do get lots of um, nice meetings, um, lots of um, uh, interactions that I would otherwise not have had. Um, and I would rather spend my money on these kinds of things than on stuff that you can buy. So, um, question to you. What do you talk about with your friends? Is it products? Or is it experiences? And please shout if you want to give me an answer. And I will wait until I get it. <laughs> yes. Uh, for me and uh, my friends. Yeah. It's, it's more experience. Though. More experience? Maybe, yes. It's been more experience. Yeah. So also products, but more experience. Yes. Yes. Anybody who agrees? Mm -hmm. Can I see hands? Mm -hmm. Who agrees? Anybody who disagrees? All right, so that's what I expected. Um, another question is, I'm stuck in this side of the room, which might be very calm for you. And um, what was one of the best moments of your life so far? And again, I'll wait until I get an answer. Can you just shout? An experience? Yeah? yeah. Alright. Would you agree? Success. Success? Where you say that? Say what did you? Sorry? Oh no, so success? Is success. that your, your best moment in life? Whenever you pass your uh, work and you get your degree, diploma, uh -huh. yeah, your sure. achievement, success is the yes. kind of the best happiness come to your life and relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. So that for you is what makes you most uh, um, Absolutely. happy or what is the best best kinds of moments of your life. Yes. All right. So I think this shows that when it comes to happiness um, or when it comes to things that you talk about with your friends, it's more experiences than products, right? And the reason behind that is that experiences make people happier than material purchases or than products. Um, because experiences are more what is called open to positive reinterpretation, which means that things that you uh, experienced are only there in your memory anymore. So they are only uh, a mental representation is what that's called. And so there's nothing in, right, you might have a photograph or a video, but really the experience is only <coughs> in your head. And we forget all the not so nice things. So experiences, once time moves on, become more positive because you don't think about the bad things anymore. Um, and these mental representations, therefore, become changed into this rosy picture, right? So 
that's also why I think when we think about, you know, back in the time when things were better, things weren't better. We just feel like they were better because we forget the bad things. Uh, and this is one of my examples. Um, this uh, summer, my husband and I uh, walked the coast to coast walk, which is in England, going from one side of England to uh, the other side, which is 300 kilometers. It took us 15 days. And when I think about this coast to coast walk, oh my God, I'm floating. It, oh, it was so great and it was so nice. But to be honest, at least one third of the time, this was the best. And that was not very nice. You can imagine. But I still feel like it was the best thing I ever did. That's why experiences are better than products, because products don't change. Experiences can change uh, <coughs> because they change in your head. Um, another reason is that experiences are more central to one's identity. Um, so when you think about yourself, you think more about your experiences <coughs> than about the stuff that you have. There, there might be some stuff um, that is really important to you, and that's also central to your identity, but usually it's experiences. So a person's life is literally the sum of the experiences that the person um, um, experience, right? Um, so if I would swap my experiences with any of you, then you would become me and I would become you to a certain extent, right? Um, and material possessions, stuff that you have, are really, however much you like them, they are outside of yourself, whereas experiences are inside of you, so they have a bigger effect on you. Um, and experiences satisfy what is called intrinsic goals, so they help you towards personal growth, towards um, uh, thinking about life, towards learning, and so on. And products, usually, you don't really learn from... Pro I'm, if you would buy a computer, then you could say that you learn from a computer, right? But it's really, it's really the very different thing. Experiences also contribute more to social relationships. Um, and that's because um, experiences are more pleasurable to talk about, right? I mean, how long can you talk about a computer? Some people can talk about computers for a very long time, right? I know, but we're not talking about the exceptions. But experiences, they have this narrative structure. So you can say, you know, do you remember when we went out to the ha ha and then we did this, and we ate that, and then, oh, it ended so nice, or maybe not nice. It's really easier to talk about experiences because you can, there's a storyline um, in them. And next to that, being materialistic is becoming much more negatively, uh, viewed negatively than being experiential. So we do like people who say, well, you know, I saved some money, the young people, I saved some money, and I'm going to go traveling for a year. That's a story where everybody thinks, ooh, that's great. But if they say, I saved some money, and I'm going to buy for a year, then everybody's like, huh? why would you do that? What's the fun and the joy in that, right? So it's, it's easier for us to talk about experience. And there's also re a relationship between experience and age. So it turns out that the happiness you enjoy from, from uh, experiences de uh, depends on age. So younger people, um, they gain more happiness from extraordinary experiences, such as bungee jumping. Um, so, and older people, they gain more happiness from very ordinary <coughs> experiences, such as having a family dinner together. Um, and I think this is interesting because the only young person over there is really sitting there being bored, waiting until this is finished. But the rest of the family is fine. So it changes um, which the type of experience you actually uh, need in order to be, to be happy. Can I ask the, can I call you the older generation in this room? Is, do you recognize this? That it changes which type of experience you enjoy? Yes? No? Not? Okay. Yeah? Mm, I, uh, okay. There's no definite uh, answer. Um, uh, go back to character building. Please regard your studies as a, not as a product, but as an experience. So you could look at your studies as buying an education or buying a diploma or buying knowledge, but it's not about that. It's about making the best of the experience that you are in. And if you look at your studies that way, then it's maybe different to study for your exams, right? Because it's, it's not so much about only passing this exam, but it's about the whole, everything around it. It's, it's about really living the experience. Okay, lesson three is connect. Um, connect to other people, and especially connect to people that you don't know or that you don't understand. Because as scientists, 
We live in this ivory tower, right, in Golden Tower, uh, and we kind of look out at the world from the top of the tower, and we know, or we sometimes feel that we know, the solutions to the problems in the world because we are the highly educated people. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think if you want to solve problems in uh, taking care of um, animals in animal shelters, talk to the people who clean the cat cages. If you want to solve the immigrant uh, or the migration problem, talk to the immigrants and talk to them about what their life is like um, right now and what they have to go through sitting in this boat for miles and miles on this uh, rocky sea. If you want to know what's going on in hospitals and why things are going wrong, talk to the nurse that helped deliver your baby. If you want to know what's the problem with elderly people, talk to an elderly person. If you want to know what disabled people feel like in terms of discrimination, talk to the disabled people. But don't sit in your ivory tower and just look out. Go out and talk to the people. Um, and there's also another uh, research on brains that shows that connection, reaching out to other people, is really why we are here. Um, so the brain, our brain, is really wired in such a way that it always tries to achieve connection. So if we are connected to other people, or if we connect to new people, then that's when our brain um, makes us feel happy. So that's really something that is very much basic to our psychological um, needs. There's different ways of reaching out or connecting, and one way is better than the other. So there's sympathy, which is, which is when you feel for people, you think, oh, you know, oh, that's, that's really bad for you. Or there's empathy, which is where you try to feel with people. You try to feel the same as these people uh, feel. And that's, I think, also the difference from looking to a problem in the, from the ivory tower, which is sympathy, right? We look down and we think, oh, all these poor people. Or climbing down and going to talk with these people, and that is empathy. Uh, and I'll show you a quick movie by Brene Brown. Yes, she's really uh, big on vulnerability and all uh, <coughs> topics that uh, are usually not taught at university, but she explains the difference between sympathy, sympathy and empathy. Very well. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, Hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> uh. So I think this is the difference between sympathy and empathy, right? And empathy is really feeling with people. And in order to do that, you need to take their perspective. You need to talk to them and fill their shoes and walk with them and then see what it is that they are experiencing. Um, you also, and this is very hard, especially for scientists, uh, need to stay out of judgment. So you don't say to these people, well, you know, this is your own fault or you're dealing with this in a stupid way. It's their way of dealing. And then look at this way and understand why they are doing these things. Because there's always reasons why they are dealing in a specific way. It's about recognizing the emotions in other people, and it's about sharing these emotions. It's about showing that you know what their emotions are like. That's what empathy is about, and that really fuels connection. That's good for connecting. Sympathy is feeling for people, which is from your own perspective. You think about what you would feel like in that position. It's about judging, right? It's about looking at the other person and then saying, huh, well, why are you feeling this? I, I don't feel that, and that's judging. It's about your own emotions, and it's really not very open communication. And I think we are usually taught to do this. But I would like to ask you to try to move to that side. So again, a responsibility uh, there. So if you want to do that, you need to be humble. You need to understand that you don't have the answers. It's the other people that have the answers. Um, you need to be imperfect, because only if you acknowledge your own uh, being imperfect, then you can also see how other people can be imperfect and not be judgmental about it. You have to allow yourself to make mistakes. And I teach a, a course in social innovation, and this is really the most difficult thing for students that uh, take that course. Because we 
create this atmosphere, and now, now I'm talking we as university people, where making mistakes is usually punished, but making mistakes is how you learn. And you have to be a generous learner, so you have to be a person that is open and willing to learn from all kinds of people. Because if you want to solve problems, you will have to deal with people that are different than you are. So you need to connect in the right way, which is, I think, not really what we are being taught at university. So maybe you need to find other ways um, to do that, right? Um, so again, as I said, this is what is not That's the four. Be your own hero. Be your own hero. <coughs> so here's a couple of heroes. Um, I don't really do heroes, so I have to think very hard who are my heroes, but you know, maybe these are people that in general would be considered heroes. So this is our queen, Maxima, Nelson Mandela, and uh, Mother Teresa, right? So these are people that we look up to when we think, oh wow, these are great people and we should learn from them, right? That's usually what we do with uh, heroes. But it's not about them. It's not about them, it's about you. You have to build your character, and you have to be your hero. So if you look up to these people who can do things that you can never do, why would you do that, right? So um, you have to be your own superhero. <laughs> um, and um, I think one of the ways in which to decide uh, which things you could still develop is the core portraits model. Um, and I'll go through this relatively quickly, um, but just to give you an idea. So you start with something that you do very well. And I'm an honest person. So if you ask me what is one of the things that you do, then I would say I'm very honest. Um, and that's a good thing. But I also go too far sometimes. And then I become blunt. What? Right? So then I become too honest. And it's really, you know, people can really think, oh my god, there she is again. Um, and what that what do I need to learn? The exact opposite of bluntness. So if I can combine honesty, which comes natural to me, and I can try to look for diplomacy, be more diplomatic, then I might become a better honest person, right? Because I know when to be honest and when to maybe not be honest, but you know, do this a little bit. Um, what's interesting about this model is that if you are too diplomatic, you become a person that doesn't have an opinion, and that's the people that are really doing that. I cannot function with people around me that don't have an opinion. That's not because of them, but that's because of me. Because not having an opinion is kind of the opposite of honesty. But what it teaches me, that the people that bug me, that irritate me, they just have a little bit too much of the thing that I need. So I can look at these people and think, okay, if they tone it down a little bit, then that's the people that I need to be learning from. Right? So um, this is a model that I think is really insightful because of this relationship, but especially because of this, of these allergies. Because everybody knows what their allergies are, right? You can all think of a type of person where you think, oh my god, I, I, too much for me. But then look at what they actually do that you need. So it's diplomacy that I need. So if I want to become my own hero, I have to focus on diplomacy. Um, the idea behind this is modeling, which is a way in which people learn. Uh, and the idea is that we learn from role models. So we learn from the people around us, the people that we see. And we learn best from people that are close to us. So people that are close physically, right, that you see often, or that um, maybe you share a room with, for instance. Um, but it's also people that are, that are like you. So you should, you should try to surround yourself with people that are like you, but a little bit different, and then it's relatively easy to learn from them. So I could try to be like Caradio from Lord of the Rings, right? Oh, this is me with this halo. But it's better, sorry, um, if I look at my uh, uh, great cousin and I think, well, she's got some qualities that I would like to have as well, and then try to be like her. Because I will never become Caradio. But it's relatively easy to look at my cousin and think, okay, she's doing this better than I am, and how can I uh, learn from her, right? Um, another thing is that we learn best in small steps. So our brain, they panic and they freeze whenever we take a step that is too big. So if we take very, very small steps, then our brain doesn't panic and freeze and then it's actually able to learn. Um, so if the steps are small enough for your brain not to notice, then you can change without this feeling. So you need, you need to choose your role models wisely. You need to 
understand who you actually can use as a role model, you need to uh, don't try to become a hero at once, don't take big steps, because it's the small steps that actually work. So you need to break learning down into small steps, right? And you need to choose small heroes. Um, and I looked into my surroundings, this time I chose my colleagues um, as um, the target here, um, and I'll show you how my colleagues are my heroes. And I only mentioned three, I can talk about each and every one of you and tell you how you are my heroes, but I'll just talk about three. But this is Kevin, and he builds these kinds of things in PowerPoint. And the first time I saw him do this, oh my god, my mouth fell open. This was during a lecture, and he's like, I didn't even know that this was possible. So I decided, every lecture that I make, I try to be a little bit more like him. And I'm improving. I'm not there, not by, by far, but I'm improving. Another hero is David. I'm happy that these two are not here because they would become very shy. Um, and he knows how to translate anything into Latin, Greek, and I think six other languages. Well, many languages. Um, so I asked him, could you please translate be your own hero into Latin? And then he said, sure, Adam. And it took him a while. And then he said, it's this. And then I was stuck because I don't speak any Latin. So how do I say this? Then I asked him, could you say this for me? And he did. Stus ipse heros. <laughs> Another um, hero of mine, um, Algrim, you just saw her standing over here. She is the reason why this is the picture that I showed you. I didn't show you a picture of male uh, academics, I showed you a picture of female academics. And she's the reason, because she always, always stresses that it's females that are as good as males. So why don't we look for female role models? And sorry, Tessa and Gabriel, the rest. I could hold the same story about you, but I did. Um, so if you want to try to be your own hero, look at the characters that you have within you. So there's always a wise person within you. There's also always a villain within you. There's always a prince or a princess and always a fairy tale. <coughs> so try to look at the situations that you encounter, which type of person you usually are in the situation, which type of role model or character you might need. So look at your characters, acknowledge them. So don't think, you know, this bad person, I, I, I can never be the bad person. Use the bad person when you can, need the bad, when you can use the bad person. But also try to understand when he or she pops up. Um, and heroes are really not perfect. You know, when we talk about Maxima, she might be perfect from the outside, but she really isn't perfect, and it's not about being perfect. They do things that make them scared. So that's what being a hero is about. And then to quote one of my heroes, and Nelson Mandela, I guess you um, might know this quote already. He says, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's the triumph over it. So um, the brave man is not the one who feels afraid, but it's the one who conquers that fear. So if you want to be a hero, if you want to be your own hero, you have to conquer your own fears. And uh, Brene Brown from the Empathy video shows that courage is contagious. So if you have courageous people around you, um, uh, that makes you more courageous, courageable, courageous, courageous, yes, uh, as well. Um, and every time we choose to show courage, we make the world around us a little bit better. Again, it's about this mimicry, right? If I am uh, I'm very brave, then other people might follow. And we make the world a little bit braver. And courage <coughs> is especially about asking for what you need. And this is a really tricky one um, for me, because I always feel that anything I need, I can do myself. That's how my father brought me up, right? He said, you never, you should never need another, well, not another person, but he said, don't ever need a man. You have to be able to stand on your own feet, which sometimes can be a little bit tricky, but let's move on to that subject. Um, so, um, I'll give you an example of me being courageous. I'm writing a children's book. This is a book for children who lost uh, somebody they uh, loved. Uh, it's in Dutch, sorry, uh, there will be an English version once this one becomes a success. Um, and I was uh, competing in a contest and I needed quotes. Um, and what I did, and I, I told you I really don't like to talk about myself, um, but I, I went uh, and talked to 1,200 people asking them to vote for my book. 
as in 1,200 people, I knocked on doors and I said, hi, my name is Alan, I'm writing this book, would you please go to my book? And it was horrible. <laughs> really. Ah. Right? Yes. I, 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 well, I don't know how many times I cried during this period, but it was many more times than I usually cry. It was, I hated it, but I did it. I didn't win, unfortunately, but I did it. I told 1,200 people about my book. So I was my own hero. And you can do the same. You just have to figure out what it is that you need, right? So when we talk about character building, I would say that you need to start delighting, you need to start experiencing, you need to start connecting in the right way, and you need to start being your own hero. And there is no path that you can find. You have to make your own path. And that's the difficulty here, right? Uh, in academics, usually there is a path. Your teachers show you the way. And you, I mean, it's a rocky road, and it's still tricky, but you can just follow the way. But here you have to make your own way. Before we end, I'll tell you an inside joke. This is me and my brother, um, one of my favorite uh, persons. And we used to have a joke, which is um, that we would both become 44 years old, because my mother died at 33, my father died at 55, and then we would add it up and divide it by two, and then we would say, well, 44, and then was, he was really relaxed, and he said, oh, I just have to live three years without you, that's doable. Okay, so that's kind of what we said to each other. Um, and we say it every time, and our family gets really annoyed when we do it, but that's what we do, that's our inside joke. Um, and then one of my coaches told me, Alan, I really don't think that this is a good outlook on life. Why would you do that? Why not say, I become 88? 33. Ooh, what's happening? Real life. My life is going back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me fix this for a minute. Oh, now it's spoiled. Don't look at this. <laughs> ah! Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Okay. I'll do it like this. Here we are again. So uh, she told me, why don't don't <coughs> why don't you live um, um, with the idea that you will become 88? And I changed that. But that means becoming 88 that I still need to live. 50 more years, and I'm done. I was done at 33. I did everything that I ever wanted to do before I was 33. So the idea of having to live another 50 <coughs> years, really, and I'm very serious, it really scares me a lot. So I need your help. Um, could you please tell me something that you've learned? A life lesson or a quote? or the best compliment you, that you've ever given or received, or an idea in which you, you could be like other people, or some, something that inspires you, or a question, or whatever it is, to get me through the next 50 years. Um, and I'm really very serious. Um, so um, when we go to the little bit room, the common room where we will have drinks, there will be pieces of paper and pens. And so please write down whatever you can give me in order to make it, because I sometimes feel like I won't if I don't get some nice uh, suggestions. All right, um, I'll go now to the last slide. It's the most important one. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening this uh, hour. Thank you for being my students and my colleagues and my friends and my family. I oh, yeah. appreciate you. Now let's go for this.